So good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Aaron Kaplan. Uh, he completed his undergraduate study from Temple uh, with a few publications right now. Uh, he is a third year uh, graduate fellow in Professor Jones uh, Purdue's group. Uh, his work mainly uh, focused on developing ground state and time dependent uh, density functional approximations uh, by satisfying exact constants. Uh, he is the co-author co of seven peer-reviewed uh, works uh, totaling about 56 citations on Google Scholar. His contributions have been appear uh, in uh, uh, respected journals such as uh, PNAS and uh, NPJ uh, computational materials. Uh, Aaron, uh, you can start now and good luck. Thank you, Dr. Nepal. And thank you everyone for attending. Um, so the title of my talk is From the Ground State to Ultra Non-Local Effects, an Analysis of Exchange Correlation Kernels for the Uniform Electron Gas. Uh, and this title might seem a little bit unusual because the ground state, and if you're familiar with the phrase ultra non-local effects, uh, you know that these aren't really tied together very tightly, but I'll try to uh, chart a clear path between the two and show how exchange correlation kernels for the uniform electron gas can sort of uh, give us information about these effects and guide further work in developing new kernels. My expertise, okay, sorry. So uh, just a brief outline of my talk. I'm gonna start by reviewing linear response to DDFT, uh, the framework in which we're going to operate, then discuss common approximations to the exchange correlation kernel. Um, and then more recent models of the exchange correlation kernel, specifically those modeling that of Gellium, uh, the MCP07 kernel. Then I'm gonna discuss how MCP07 can uh, describe phases, excited states, and other emergent phenomena in Gellium. Uh, then discuss ultra non-locality and optical properties. And lastly, use all of this information to uh, motivate and derive a new model for the exchange correlation kernel in Gellium, which we're calling TC21. Uh, but my expertise is primarily in ground state DFT. So I'd really like to draw comparisons between first principles ground state DFT and first principles TD DFT uh, when I can. Within GS DFT, ground state DFT, our central objective is an accurate approximation of the XC energy and the ground state energy, uh, density. Um, and we do this uh, in first principles ground state DFT by enforcing exact constraints. And these are known limiting behaviors of the exact exchange correlation energy functional itself. Um, and the simplest model of this is the local spin density approximation or LSDA, which just depends on the local one body spin densities. Uh, LSD is most accurate for properties of simple metals um, and it's constrained typically to recover the exact exchange correlation energy of a uniform electron gas of arbitrary spin polarization. Above that is the generalized gradient approximation, GGA. Uh, first principles GGAs add this dimensionless density gradient S um, here, weighted by the Fermi wavelength on the denominator. Um, and these reduce to the LSD in the limit of a uniform density and are constrained to recover further um, gradient expansions known for the exchange correlation energy or perhaps for large Z atoms, atoms that are very heavy. Uh, and these can either be designed to be accurate for properties of solids or finite systems, but not both. Above this are the meta GDAs, which add the one body kinetic energy densities. Uh, and so meta GDAs are semi-local both in the density and the orbital. You see here that the Cauchy-Moore orbitals, the gradients are required. Uh, whereas in the GGA, just the gradient and the density itself is required. These are sort of doubly semi-local, semi whereas a GGA is only semi-local in the density. Uh, with this added information, a meta GGA can give us possible high accuracy for a very wide range of solid and finite systems. And the meta GGA also embeds the GGA below it. Um, and so we have this sort of nesting doll system here for first principles functionals. Both this are non-local functionals, exact exchange, van der Waals corrections, et cetera. Um, and these can range from anywhere from first principles to purely empirical models. In contrast, in linear response time, time dependent DFT, uh, we can no longer really define uh, the ground state energy with, without an uncertainty. And so instead, we have to approximate the exchange correlation um, potential itself or the kernel defined here through this functional derivative. Um, since I'm going to be focusing on the uniform electron gas or gelium, uh, I'm going to work in reciprocal space. And I'd like to note that even though the full exchange correlation kernel for an arbitrary system can depend on two positions or two wave vectors and then the time difference. 
Uh, in gallium, it only depends upon one wave vector q and then the frequency omega because the ground state phase at normal densities, which is a spin on polarized liquid, uh, has spherical symmetry in real space and hence in reciprocal space. So FXC chi naught, the cone sham response function for non-interacting electrons, and chi, the overall response function, which is just the cone sham response function weighted by an effective dielectric function, um, are all, are all uh, can only depend on q and omega, the magnitude of q and omega. Uh, q again is the wave vector and omega is the frequency in reciprocal space, in reciprocal time space. Um, and why even bother focusing on gallium here uh, when gallium doesn't model many realistic systems? Um, and that's because sort of as the LSD is the building block for much more sophisticated uh, exchange correlation functionals, and having an LSD is based upon gallium, having a more accurate approximation for the XC kernel of gallium can also be a building block for the XC kernel of real systems. So again, using the kind of embedding principle where our nesting doll principle where we use the simplest model as the base to recover um, what known properties we currently have available. Some common approximations to the XC kernel are the random phase approximations. This is by far the simplest, it just takes the exchange correlation kernel to be zero. Um, and this recovers 100% uh, of exact exchange, but it recovers really only short range correlation and is most accurate for simple models again, sort of like the LSD. Above this is the adiabatic local density approximation or ALDA. Uh, which takes the, the second functional derivative of LSD or LDA's uh, exchange correlation energy evaluated at the local density. Uh, and so it's fully local in space and local in time. Because these are the two simplest uh, approximations to FXC, they're good baselines for um, uh, new kernels, which might be able to give us more information about real systems or even about jelly. Above this are dynamic LDAs which are local in space, but non-local in time. They have no Q dependence, only frequency dependence. And conversely, static kernels, which have the reverse uh, dependence, dependence on Q, but no dependence on frequency. Uh, now, both of these are building blocks, dynamic LDA and static kernels uh, for more sophisticated functionals, but I'm going to focus more on dynamic LDAs here. A very important feature of the exact kernel is that is non-analytic. The exact static omega to zero and long wavelength Q to zero limit is non-unique. Depending on the order in which you take the limits, you might either recover the ALDA kernel um, from TDDFT or a more complicated limit, uh, which is the sum of the ALDA kernel, and then a term involving the exchange correlation shear modulus uh, for bulk viscoelastic gallium. Um, and this term is not known in general. However, we have found a pretty accurate parameterization for this. Um, and now this limit, this latter limit is not derived within the context of time dependent DFT, but derived in the context of time dependent current DFT for the longitudinal kernel. Um, because in TDC DFT, the kernel is promoted to a tensor quantity and the head element can be associated with the regular XC kernel of TD DFT. So older dynamic LDAs like that of Gross, Cohn, and Iwamoto only recover the TD DFT limit, just the ALDA. Uh, but newer models like that of Chen and Vignale can recover the lighter limit, and they are uh, constructed explicitly to do so. So I'll discuss these, um, discuss why one might choose one over the other. Um, but an important feature of both of these models is that they only prescribe the imaginary part of the kernel for real valued omega in closed form, uh, and then assume that the real part is constructed by Kramer's quantity relations, which, is, which are generally difficult to uh, evaluate in practice, so when performing real computations. A completely alternative construction uh, to this philosophy is the method of local field factors uh, due to Hubbard. Uh, instead, we can associate uh, with the exchange correlation kernel a spin symmetric local field factor, G plus, um, which you see is just related to the XC kernel through a factor of minus Q squared over four pi. Uh, we can also derive uh, a spin anti-symmetric local field factor that gives us information about the spin-spin response uh, whereas the XC kernel or the spin symmetric local field factor can only give us information about the density density response. Um, and it should be noted that even though the XC kernel isn't explicitly spin resolved, it does include um, uh, same and opposite spin correlations implicitly. It's just not resolved into separate components like one would do for local field factors. Uh, the local field factor approach is was taken by Vashista and Singwe, Pathak and Vashista and Dabrowski. I'm mentioning these here because we are actually going to use um, a technique that Dabrowski pioneered to um, develop a new kernel. 
the problem with these is that they don't have closed form expressions. Um, they're typically evaluated recursively or um, iteratively. Uh, the most sophisticated of these that uh, of recent work is Richardson and Ashcroft, which is derived only for imaginary frequency. And so to evaluate the kernel at real frequency, as would be appropriate for a lot of situations, this again needs to be constructed uh, through some kind of kramer scormig relation. Now, the main focus of my talk uh, are what I'm going to call doubly non-local XC kernels, which are non-local in space and time. So they have Q dependence and they have omega dependence. Um, the, the bedrock of this is the Constantine Petarchy 2007 um, XC kernel, and then it's more successful in the MCP07 or modified CP07 kernel. Uh, because of the way the, these are constructed, they can respect a wide range of constraints that are known on the exact XC kernel, uh, such as zero and infinite frequency limits, as well as the exchange correlation energy gradient expansions. Uh, the gradient expansion, just like for the ground state case, is appropriate for a static long wave wavelength perturbation. So this is the limit that Q goes to zero. Um, and the gradient coefficients are known pretty accurately from the theory of uh, ground state DFT. A completely alternative construction, which I'll just mention here for completeness, is that of connector theory, uh, where one would perform a high-level calculation for the XC kernel once, and this could be in QMC or with Fermi hypernetted chain, as was done in reference three. Uh, and then all one has to do is derive an operator that connects the higher level FXC to a lower level one and possibly interpolate it. So this isn't a closed form expression. Um, it's sort of a prescription for taking tabulated data and mapping it to a, a kernel that is just a function of Q and omega and RS. Now, MCP07 is constructed as an interpolation between static and long wavelength limits. Uh, and this is done so that exact constraints in the kernel can be recovered. Um, for the long wavelength or Q to zero limit, it recovers the GKI or gross cone Iwamoto dynamic LDA. And then for the static limit is a improved CP07 kernel that builds on the gradient expansion terms. Um, and also a more correct Q to infinity limit. Importantly, even though the GKI kernel does not prescribe um, a real part in closed form, MCP07 does, it attempts to parameterize this real part. And I should also note here that an analytic expression for the real part of the GKI kernel is known, but it involves non-standard functions like elliptic integrals. Um, uh, importantly though, MCP07 does not prescribe the analytic continuation of the GKI kernel to imaginary frequencies. Um, now that is important in the case of evaluating correlation energies, uh, just for very practical purposes. Um, it's much more numerically stable to evaluate the correlation energy along the imaginary frequency axis, uh, where the response function is much smoother and doesn't require as nearly as dense of a grid. Um, and as we'll show, MCP07 uh, quantitatively correct, uh, gives quantitatively correct predictions of some excited state phenomena in Jellium, as well as some of the um, symmetry broken phases in Jellium, which is where I will start. So up to about the density parameter RS um, of about 75 Bohr, the ground state of the uniform electron gas or jillium is a spin unpolarized fluid. So it has perfectly spherical symmetry. Um, common kernels like the ALDA and the GKI dynamic LDA are derived for this phase only. And so any kind of kernel that builds upon these like MCP07 is also really only motivated for the spin unpolarized phase. A spin resolved kernel or a local field factor could also describe phases of arbitrary spin polarization. But we'll see that MCP07 and our successor kernel also give some qualitatively correct predictions of the other phases. Uh, beyond RS equals 75 Bohr, the ground state can actually be a symmetry broken phase. Between 75 and 100 Bohr, uh, it's a ferromagnetic fluid. And then above 100 Bohr, about 100 Bohr, it's a Wigner crystal or charge density wave phase. Uh, the ALDA does find a Wigner crystal phase, but at a very wrong density of RS about 30. Um, by contrast, MCP07 predicts a much more realistic picture, finding the uh, Wigner crystal or charge density wave phase at about RS equals 69 Bohr. So on the right is a, a figure reproduced from our, our work submitted to PNAS, which is an average density fluctuation, which we're calling an average plasmon frequency, uh, which is the first frequency moment of the spectral function weighted by the static structure factor, uh, SQ. And uh, to recall from the adiabatic connection fluctuation dissipation fear, the dynamic structure factor is related to the imaginary part of the response function um, here. 
So we see that at a normal metallic density, RS equals four, the plasmon dispersion is purely upwards. Um, and again, plasmon dispersion I'm using here to refer to the average density fluctuation. Whereas at RS equals 69, the plasmon dispersion tends down, eventually dropping to about zero, indicating that a um, within at least Anderson's interpretation of symmetry breaking, a, an average fluctuation in the density is freezing out and uh, producing a symmetry broken phase, whereas uh, one would expect a non-symmetry broken phase from the Hamiltonian. And again, there are these two bumps. Um, so here drops down to zero frequency and then returns back upwards to non-zero frequency. Um, and so this very clearly shows that MCPO7 is capturing some essential physics of gelium in predicting the onset of a Wigner crystal phase at a more realistic density of RS equals 69. MCPO7 also gives a much better picture of uh, ground state correlation energies, especially in the metallic range. Um, here, we're going to focus on metallic range, meaning RS between one and 10 bore, uh, very typical of simple metals and even some uh, valence densities of semiconductors. So on the right, I'm showing the mean error, mean absolute error, and then a quantity that I'm calling standard deviation defined here, um, not exactly conventional standard deviation, uh, all in Hartree per electron. And the reference values here are taken from the Purdue Wong 1992 LDA, uh, sort of the, the bedrock foundation of all first principles GGAs and GGAs from our group. Uh, we see a few very important things here. RPA systematically underestimates correlation energies. Um, you see the mean error is negative and equal mag due to the MAE, whereas ALDA completely overcorrects the RPA. Um, same magnitude of error, but in the opposite direction. Now, adding in either the uh, frequency dependence alone, like in GKI or, Q or QV, Chen Van ben Yellen kernel, um, dramatically reduces the error by an order of magnitude. And then adding in both the uh, frequency and wave vector dependence, as in either of the two MCPO7 results, um, reduces the error further, but not, but not perfectly. Um, now here, MCPO7 with GKI is the standard uh, published version of MCPO7, whereas the MCPO7 with the QV frequency dependence is a modified kernel uh, that replaces the GKI part with the Chen Vanilli kernel um, and recovers the time dependent DFT limit, so just the ALDI. And that is because this gives a slightly better estimate of correlation energies. The full table with uh, a few other uh, functionals is uh, included in this preprint. So I encourage you to look at that if you're curious. But the important thing here to note is that either flavor of MCPO7 gives the most accurate prediction of correlation energies. Also interesting is that the standard deviations are uh, very close to each other, even though the magnitude of errors are very different. And that tells us basically that the shapes of these kernels as a function of RS are um, mostly correct, but they are just predicting wrong values. Now we'll move on to the ultra non-locality or optical properties part of my talk. Um, ultra non-locality refers to the extreme long range or long wavelength part of the XC kernel. Uh, this is the Q to zero limit of the kernel and it's typically written as uh, the Hartree kernel four pi E squared over Q squared multiplied by a constant uh, alpha of omega and with a negative sign included. Um, and because this is a long wavelength part of the kernel, it's useful for describing optical phenomena. Um, and we know uh, from experience that other kernels based on the uniform electron gas likely can't predict realistic ultra non-locality uh, or spectral properties of real materials. Now, previous works that have used empirical methods to build an XC kernel in this limit, um, so prescribing a form for alpha, have related the uh, bulk dielectric constant of semiconductors to a functional form for alpha and also the band gap semiconductors. However, a purely first principles approach was derived from metals and other uh, weakly inhomogeneous materials, so slowly varying materials. Um, and this is derived from perturbation theory within time dependent current DFT. We see here it's a sum over reciprocal lattice vectors G and then uh, a sort of a difference between the dynamic part of the kernel evaluated at a uniform or average density uh, minus its static part. So alpha of omega will always be uh, zero for omega equals zero. Um, and this is a problem for semiconductors. It may not be a problem for metals, um, but we'll see clearly that this expression is most valid for metals uh, by actually evaluating this. Um, now I'm gonna start with semiconductors for which this expansion is not as valid. Uh, and that is because we don't really have any information about what the ultra non-locality coefficient should look like for metals, uh, but we do for semiconductors. So like I said, uh, alpha for omega equals zero, the static limit, 
is about 0.2 for silicon. Um, and we see that of all the kernels here, so MCP07, which I've discussed, MCP07 with K bar equals zero. K bar is essentially a damping parameter that um, damps out the frequency dependence of MCP07 as the wave vector grows very large. So this has a much stronger frequency dependence than MCP07. And then the GKI dynamic LDA uh, in green. Uh, I've also plotted some kernels with more sophisticated frequency dependence, like Chen Vignale, and then the time dependent MCP07 QV hybrid kernel. So MCP07 with QV replacing the GKI part. We see that the two uh, QV based kernels give the most realistic description of optical properties, um, but still not necessarily exactly correct. So QV is the most correct. And then the damping in MCP07 um, reduces this slightly. Uh, also important to note is that all of the DKI kernels have exactly the wrong sign uh, for the ultra non-locality coefficient, suggesting that they are widely missing the mark for optical properties. I'm now turning to metals uh, for sodium based off a pseudo-potential density for the valence electrons. Uh, we see a very similar behavior um, with QV and then the QV MCP07 kernel predicting uh, sort of the right sign for the ultra non-locality coefficient at optical frequencies and then all kernels tending to a negative limit for uh, higher frequencies. Uh, this is really the first look at ultra non locality coefficients in real solids. And so we expect uh, these results to just be instructive and in guiding further construction of kernels. Um, not really definitive in telling us uh, uh, what the exact kernel should look like, because clearly none of these are getting uh, what we expect to be the correct behavior, at least from our work with semiconductors. So how can we use these uh, prior analyses to build a better model of the XC kernel? Um, again, I'm going to draw a comparison from ground state DFT uh, because the uh, construction principles we use there can also be instructive in TDDFT. And I want to talk specifically about the paradigm of the strongly constrained and appropriately normed or scanned meta GGA, which is built to um, constrain to all known limiting behaviors of the exact EXC. Um, that can be applied at the meta GGA level. It can't be one electron self interaction free. That's the only one that is not applied. Uh, scan also added the idea of appropriate norms, which are systems that a meta GGA can be exact for, like the uniform electron gas, slowly varying densities or weakly inhomogeneous densities, or at least highly accurate, like the hydrogen atom or spherical atoms, the closed shell atoms like uh, helium, neon, krypton. And because of this construction, SCAN is very general purpose. We get almost the right answer for the right reasons for almost all systems. Um, over SCAN has some problems, which is an unexpected computational complexity. Uh, which I and my coworkers uh, work to reduce in the R2 scan functional. And R2 scan um, takes the construction principles of scan and adds to that the reasonable principle of numerical efficiency. And we show that the accuracy of scan for virtually all the systems that uh, we know scan to be accurate for can be maintained with a lower computational cost. So I'd like to apply this philosophy then to TDDFT, uh, specifically MCP07. We know that MCP07 is most accurate for a metallic range of densities, like I showed. Um, however, it is much more um, incorrect for densities below RS equals one or densities above RS equals 10 in terms of the correlation energies. Um, and its spectral function, especially at low densities, has unphysically large peaks, uh, which we showed in the uh, paper on density fluctuations and symmetry breaking. Um, and that those peaks don't line up with known um, behaviors of the spectral function found from QMC data. Uh, now, the low density region are, are typically not as energetically relevant as these higher density ones, but they are relevant for systems uh, like semiconductors, which have low density interstices, or systems with vacancies or voids like defect systems. Uh, and from a practical standpoint, it, um, the values of the MCP07 kernel at imaginary frequencies uh, having to be evaluated by analytic continuation is an unnecessary computational expense that can be reduced pretty simply, as I'll show. By contrast, the QV dynamic LDA offers very good physics at high cost. So built into the QV kernel is not only the frequency dependence of GKI, but um, a sort of model of an exciton excitation. The problem with the QV kernel is that the real part must be evaluated by Kramer's Kronig integral uh, repeatedly. And there is no way that we have found so far to accurately parameterize it. And same as with MCP07, uh, analytic continuation has to be used to evaluate it for imaginary frequency. And this is a high um, numerical cost for a kernel that offers good physics. So um, 
our view is that we can take the GKI kernel in MCP07 and instead um, add in some modulations to better reproduce um, the frequency dependence of other kernels. So same as with the construction principles and going from scan to R2 scan, we want to keep all of the exact constraints that MCP07 uh, maintained on the kernel, improve the energy of the, of the appropriate norms when possible, uh, for our case, just the uniform electron gas, and then reduce the computational cost. We're calling this new model the Tightly Constrained 2021 or TC21 kernel. Uh, I have to apologize that the preprint hasn't gone live yet. It's uh, sort of gummed up in the archive machine memory and will be published, uh, I think, by tomorrow morning. Uh, so if you're interested, I encourage you to check again tomorrow. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so starting with the building block, the GKI dynamic LDA, it really captures the essential physics in a simple form. Other author authors have noted that it is not nearly complicated enough to recover the exact frequency dependence of the kernel. Um, and so I will show how we can get a more sophisticated frequency dependence from it. Uh, the GKI kernel its simplicity is very useful for numerical purposes because it can be cast in a density scaled form. Um, the real part and the imaginary part are slowly functions of y, uh, where these density dependent terms are defined in the MCP07 paper. In the real, in the original work, only g of y was prescribed, h of y was parameterized in MCP07. Um, however, the parameterization chosen by MCP07 was not ideal. So the, the simplest and um, way to improve on MCP07 is to just reparameterize this function h, which describes the real part of the GKI kernel at all frequencies. On the left, we have the difference between the approximate um, expression for h and then the kramers cronin result. And we see that MCP07 makes the largest errors at um, intermediate values of the scaled frequency. Uh, and this is important because this is um, the most common range for some, like optical frequencies. Again. Uh, TC21 makes very small errors, sort of asymptotically decaying to zero. On the right, we have the actual plot of the H function. Um, and so TC21 represents a much better parameterization of the kramers kronig uh, value and of the analytic expressions. And we have also in our work prescribed a, um, an accurate parameterization of the analytic continuation to imaginary frequencies that could be used in lieu of um, an integral construction of the analytic continuation. So very good for numerical purposes, which should help reduce computational cost. Here is the uh, general model of the TC21 kernel. We see that it's constructed as an interpolation between a modified GKI kernel, modified in the sense that we're using a new parameterization for H, um, and using a scaled frequency omega, which I will discuss. Um, so for the static limit, Q to zero, TC21 tends to the GKI kernel. Um, and for the long wavelength, I'm sorry, for the long wavelength limit, TC21 tends to the GKI kernel, and for the static limit, tends to the MCP07 kernel, which is unmodified, except for the underlying LDA. Um, MCP07 used the Purdue Zunger approximation of the correlation energy. We are instead using Purdue Wong, just to use a more updated and uh, analytic approximation. Now, the, the screening wave vector K tilde is constructed as uh, an interpolation between high and low densities. At low densities, um, exchange and correlation have the same length scale, the Fermi wave vector, whereas at high densities, the length scale is, for correlation becomes the Thomas Fermi wave vector, which is proportional to the square root of the, uh, the Fermi wave vector. So K tilde is constructed as an approximation between a function that uh, is to the lowest order in its Taylor series, Kf, proportional to Kf, and then at higher densities, proportional to uh, the Thomas Fermi wave vector. Now the scale frequency is just a function of P and Q, uh, sorry, a function of Q and RS multiplying omega uh, seen here. And P is uh, motivated in such a way that for the long wavelength Q to zero limit, um, we recover the GKI kernel exactly. Now at higher densities, uh, essentially RS greater than the square root of C, uh, this, and one over the square root of C, the one over square root of C here came out to be about 4.74. So um, this is sort of at the outer edge of the metallic range and much lower densities. Uh, for those densities, intermediate to low densities, P enhances the frequency dependence and makes the GKI kernel tend more rapidly to its infinite frequency limit. Um, and at lower densities, RS less than about uh, 4.7 bore, P actually slows down the approach to the infinite frequency limit. Um, and this, 
as we'll see, is very useful for recovering accurate correlation energies. Now, the four parameters in TC21, A, B, C, and D, were fitted to, uh, uh, well, essentially were determined by minimizing the errors in the Jellian correlation energy only between RS equals one and 100. But from this plot, uh, TC21 is in Burgundy. We see that the model is still extrapolative well beyond RS equals 100. And if I blew up the plot more, you would see that it's uh, ex extrapolative for RS less than one, uh, which is very important because it indicates our model is robust and should be appropriate for um, calculations with real systems. It's not overfitted to the data, um, which is an important numerical problem that we've uh, ensured is not inherent to our model. Uh, I'll mention again that the um, uh, scale frequency is actually inspired by Dabrowski's model for the local field factor, uh, which took the GKI kernel and essentially tried to scale up the frequency dependence um, to the infinite frequency limit and also add in more wiggles, which um, it, essentially because the GKI kernel is too simple in its construction uh, to recover all the exact properties of the Jellium uh, dynamic LDA. Uh, for reference, the black line is the Purdue Wong LDA, TC21 adheres quite closely to it. Um, and like I said before, MCB07 deviates pretty sharply from uh, PW92 for intermediate to low density jellium. Um, an important test of the frequency dependence of an exchange correlation kernel is the third moment sum rule, which asserts that the third frequency moment of the dynamic spectral function is equal to uh, this function, sigma 3r. And we see by the structure of both equations that neither quantity is exact. Uh, both have to be evaluated numerically. The right-hand side uh, is a function of the static structure factor, and the left-hand side is a function of the dynamic structure factor. And because the uh, third frequency moment weights very heavily, large frequencies, um, this is a very sensitive test of numerical stability. Um, essentially, if this integral cannot converge, it means that the high frequency dependence of our spectral function, or XE kernel, is very wrong. Um, and as we'll see, you see here the shapes of the curves are similar, but I really want to point out that the scale of the axes are very different. On the left is MCB07, and on the right is TC21. Um, now, for uh, normal metallic densities, RS equals 4 and RS equals 10, uh, the magnitude of errors is similar. TC21 does reduce the error in the third moment sum rule slightly. Uh, perhaps I shouldn't say error. Uh, what I'm plotting here is a relative difference in the two sides, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Um, and neither quantity here is exact uh, because we have to evaluate both numerically. But at much lower densities, MCP07 makes a significant error or significant uh, percent difference, let's say, in the third moment sum rule. And this uh, at RS equals 69, RS equals 100, so the burgundy and black dash curves, respectively. The errors are very, very large, especially as Q grows. Uh, in contrast, for TC21, the maximum error at these lower densities is minus 0.2 compared to minus 0.8 for MCP07. Also note that the MCP07 curve is very jagged. It means the um, uh, numerical stability of the calculation is much lower than in TC21. You see that there are some wiggles uh, really at lower densities, but these are really damped out. Uh, and this is a good indication for practical calculations. Uh, a few more. Excuse me. Yep. <laughs> you just have like uh, one, one minute left. Oh, so okay. Minutes. Sorry. I'll rush through this. Uh, Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, so just a few more slides. Um, the ALDA here. Uh, this is essentially plotting the effective dielectric function that weights the overall response function. Uh, shows that the ALDA predicts the onset of a CDW charge density wave at RS about 30. TC21 and MCP07 both predict it at about RS equals 68 to 69. Um, TC21 and MCP07 differ because of the underlying ALDAs differing. On the right is again a density fluctuation plot or a plasma dispersion curve. There's essentially no change between the two at metallic densities. But uh, TC21 has an artifact at much lower densities, uh, wherein it does not predict onset of a static charge density wave from this analysis. Uh, we see that it, its uh, plasma dispersion never tends towards zero, and so the density fluctuation never freezes out. Um, and then TC21 gives a little bit better description of ultra non-locality coefficient, but still very wrong. Um, future work needs to take this into consideration and use a much more sophisticated model of the frequency dependence. 
Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention, as well as the Department of Energy and Temple University for support. Uh, right now, our paper isn't live, but the two other papers on ultra locality and symmetry breaking are. You're welcome to view those. And then our code and data are available now publicly. So thank you for your attention. Happy to answer your questions. Sorry, I went over time.